Meredith Machen. I'm the projects director for the League of Women Voters of New Mexico and the organizer of New Mexico Listens for this event. I wanna welcome you to New Mexico's Women, Heritage and Innovation Herstory Symposium. And I wanna thank Santa Fe Prep, Brad Fairbanks for helping uh, to make this program happen. We have, uh, we're gonna hear about women from the historians and teachers, and we're going to find out more about the rich contributions of, to our multicultural environment. Uh, anyway, I'm going to introduce, um, well, we have Bethany Tabor, who's our program officer from the New Mexico Humanities Council. And New Mexico Listens is a collaborative venture of the League of Women Voters of New Mexico and the New Mexico Humanities Council. The National Endowment for the Humanities has an initiative that's going around in every state that's called a more perfect union. And uh, New Mexico Humanities Council is working with us to see how we all can make a democracy work better, uh, create a more perfect union. It's in advance of the 250th anniversary of our democracy. And I'll say more in a minute. I want to thank our panelists for being here today. We have Francis Levine, Dr. Francis Levine on the far end, Lisa Nordstrom in the middle, Robin Farwell Gavin. Then we have in this table, Nicolasa Chavez and Sylvia Ramos Cruz. And I'll say more about them in just a moment. I'm gonna take the liberty of making a few comments as the moderator here. And while this forum is focused on the past and highlighting the stories of remarkable women who have demonstrated courage, creativity, persistence, and commitment to improving lives, not just for women and girls, but for families and communities, uh, we have to uh, think of the context of this moment there is so much going on. And I think of uh, women's history as kind of being in a pre-Hubble telescope uh, era. We are only seeing a few of the millions and millions of stars. Uh, we hope one day we will have the web telescope capability and we, we can see way farther into the past and see the millions of bright stars out there. And uh, we need everybody's help to make that happen. Uh, we have seen so much happen in the news recently about women. Women's stories are starting to emerge, but they're still not in history books. We can all recall memorizing uh, war dates and battles and presidents and treaties and so on. A few rogue women have made it into the history books, such as Anne Hutchinson, who was banished from the uh, New England colonies for speaking out. But for the most part, you, you know, there are only a few people who have made it into the history books. Eleanor Roosevelt, um, apparently was kicked out of the Texas textbooks when they had to include Hillary Clinton because she had run for president. The publishers decided that they couldn't fit in, you know, too many women. We're wondering if Kamala Harris will be in the history books. As an educator and league member who has worked for social justice and equality for decades, I know that women's voices are needed to be heard now more than ever. While women represent 51.6% of the US population, we have less, fewer than, uh, we have less than 28% of Congress as female. Our New Mexico legislature has done better and I'm hoping that we'll see more women elected to office. I'm honored to uh, present our esteemed panelists. And we are going to start first with Lisa Nordstrom. Uh, Lisa is 
excuse me, I want to read her little bio. Lisa Nordstrom, history teacher here at Santa Fe Prep School. KM, uh, she's New Mexico K-12 certified teacher with 30 years of experience. She's a former educator for the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture and New Mexico History Museum. Her work with the New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs will broaden appreciation of the numerous contributions women have made to our state. She'll tell you more about the New Mexico Historic Women's Marker Project and what she's doing with her students in just a moment. Um, and I will turn the mic over to Lisa Nordstrom right now. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be presenting here today. Many thanks to NEH New Mexico Listens and the New Mexico League of Women Voters for sponsoring and organizing this symposium. Having been born and raised in New Mexico, I always appreciated the layered history and cultural diversity of this enchanting land. My academic degrees in Southwest Studies and Women's Studies from the Colorado College opened my mind to more than I imagined as a girl growing up here in Santa Fe. I furthered my education at UNM, acquiring my teaching licensure, my K through 12 teaching licensure. Teaching and educating in the Santa Fe Public Schools and the museum system led me to my current position here as the seventh grade New Mexico history teacher, as well as an upper school history elective teacher. I approach my teaching through seeking historical stories and voices. By teaching students how to be detectives, developing inquiry and research skills, we create connections between the past and the present. I feel these connections lead students toward new awareness, deeper curiosity, and ultimately taking action. I invite you now to take a look at the six photographs that are up on the screen. These are women that I will reveal their names later in my talk, but just take a look for a moment and see if you recognize any of these images. I know one of the panelists recognizes at least one of them. Why do I believe the history curriculum needs a focus on women? As a student in the Santa Fe public schools system, I was inspired by several teachers at Santa Fe High that utilize storytelling as a tool in the classroom. My English lit classes had particularly innovative teachers that focused on women authors. However, it was not the case in my history class, any of my history classes, and I questioned where in the textbooks. This inspired my investigations into the voices of those not included in the textbooks. I continue to modify my seventh grade curriculum here at Santa Fe Prep to be more expansive, creating focus areas of study to enable my students to connect more deeply with the stories of people in New Mexico. Several years ago, as I searched for information about unique women who were instrumental in our history here, I came upon the website for the New Mexico Historic Women's Marker Program, She Who Shaped New Mexico. What a treasure. I immediately began to imagine projects for my seventh graders, including research skills and creative expression. The end result were colorful informational posters of these women, including images, text, and did you know facts, sprinkling the halls here at Santa Fe Prep to educate others um, during the month of March. Here is a summary of the breakdown of the project. Within a specified broad topic, students self-select their research focus, often based upon personal interests. This allows for authentic interactions with the source as a student develops ownership of their learning. One style of source analysis that we utilize here at Santa Fe Prep that I use with my seventh graders and other students is this soapstone method. There are various versions of this um, available at the application on various uh, websites and teacher resources, but this is the brief breakdown of what I how I approach my students learning of analyzing sources in the classroom. And this soapstone method 
can be applied to both primary and secondary sources. I find it a very useful, useful format. And this is just an example of a portion of one of my students' um, papers when they did the first analysis run at uh, using the women's markers and the woman that she focused on, Little Sister Lozen. Now, now I'm just going to offer a sampling for your viewing of some of the women from the She Who Shaped New Mexico website that are featured on the, women, the women's markers throughout our state. Uh, my students selected some of these women to learn more about, and I selected these particular slides to show you uh, today because they are especially focusing on women that took activist roles in our community in various ways. My inspiration stems from women such as these and it continues to expand as the list grows. These women exemplify resistance in their own unique ways. Helping students begin to think critically about society, identify its problems, and work toward solutions. Some of the additional uh, resources that I utilize in my classroom, I'd like to share just briefly as well. And one are the women on this panel today. I'd like to recognize the wealth of knowledge sitting at these two, at these two tables. Um, and I have actually had the opportunity to work with several of these women throughout my years of teaching in various modalities. Um, the ongoing research sitting at this table is very expansive. Um, here, what I'd like to show on my slide are just some of the various ways that I access different types of resources for my students. And what I'd like to emphasize is the final point there, the museums and libraries, the local museums and libraries. So any teacher in their hometown has some resource that will speak more directly to students. Um, and I find that in students really applying those direct local histories and hearing the story of where they live specifically um, really taps into that curiosity and they then develop more um, interest in, in her story. Now we'll return to the slide that I started with. Uh, last year, I was given the opportunity to develop a Women of the Southwest Honors Level course here at PrEP, and I dove headfirst into the scholarship and resources. This slide shows you the names of the women that I had up before, and I now invite you to take a look at the names that I have listed and see if it is useful in perhaps recognizing some of these women by name um, as well as by image. My class of six honors level seniors embarked on this journey with me, bringing endless curiosity about the voices of Southwestern women throughout time. As our classroom culture grew, each student set about the task of examining She Who Shaped New Mexico website. With dedicated ongoing assistance from our mentors, Students discovered women of interest from the working list of women we added and conducted research in local archives, libraries, and finally wrote a short biography that will eventually be part of the website. So the web pages will be um, published that my students worked on. I'm very, very proud of their accomplishments. And these are the six women that my students researched that will be added to the website. Here is a slide of the, the process for the capstone project that my students worked on, Fiesta y Sena. It's a creative imagining of six women of New Mexico sitting down to share a meal, the story of their journeys, a spirited conversation, and wonderings about the future of our forever blue sky state. Through artistic interpretations, a place setting for each woman represents her place in the history of New Mexico. This slide shows the Fiesta uh, Isena event that we had in the library here at PrEP and invited community members to come and actually see the entire table setting of these women having their conversation. Each student eloquently spoke at this event, sharing their research process and the content about each of the women they researched. These place settings not only enabled students to have freedom of expression in a un unique modality, 
to exhibit their learning and appreciation for the woman's life experiences. But it also, as an installment, is an accessible um, mode for multiple audiences. I think that different age learners can really gain um, information from this visual representation of the women and their stories that my students researched. So the stories become relatable, the women become inspirational, and this leads to student action. I actually took Dr. Levine over to the library before we began today to show her the display that's now in the library case here at PrEP. So these plates are now an installment in the, in the PrEP library so others can view these plates and the place settings. As a collaboration with the community, the students participated also in weekly off-campus field trips. Again, visiting that idea that interacting in museums and archives is essential for student learning. These visits to local museums provided a real world experience. And not only did my students develop research skills, they were under the guidance of professionals in the field. They discovered the richness of primary sources with the bonus of learning about unique career paths. I have one student that is currently working as an intern this summer in one of the museums that we visited. So she pursued that after having spent time in the library there at the Wheelwright Museum. One of the components of this is the service learning model that I utilized with my, with my students. Service learning was an essential component of this class as we developed a relationship with the mentors from the International Women's Forum, New Mexico and others in Santa Fe. Service learning creates opportunities for students to meet community needs through direct engagement with an organization. This model includes these four primary components, investigation, preparation, action, and demonstration. Throughout the entire process, students pause for curriculum reflection through both formal and informal assessments. The goal is for students to actively and passionately engage in meaning a community need while experiencing personal growth and reflection skills. The personal curricula work that I have presented today is just a small part of what I've been working on in my classroom, but it led to an opportunity that I've been given to develop a K-12 curriculum um, about the women of New Mexico. Through the efforts of IWF New Mexico and the support of the New Mexico legislature and Governor Mich Michelle Lujan Grisham, funding was provided to the Department of Cultural Affairs to support the New Mexico Historic Women Marker Program, an initiative of International Women's Forum New Mexico to preserve, promote, and expand accessibility of the stories of women who have shaped the history of New Mexico, her story. The appropriation included that funding be provided to support the development of units of study curricula to teach New Mexico students K through 12 about the historic women who were part of the very fabric of our state. This curriculum will be aligned to the New Mexico PED social studies and humanities content standards for use by educators, students, and the general public. It will bring intentional inclusion of women's roles to the forefront of teaching. Some of the areas I will focus the lessons on include examination of the She Who Shaped New Mexico website to create interpretive projects, development of secondary source research skills and extensions into primary source research through related archival documents, collections of journals and letters, photographs, newspaper articles and images. I greatly appreciate this opportunity to contribute to this in educational ende endeavor. Look at the New Mexico, look for the New Mexico Historic Women's Markers featured in the New Mexico Magazine and El Palacio editions in March of this year for Women's History Month. Portions of the curriculum will be accessible at that point through the She Who Shaped New Mexico website and potentially additional websites. Women in the American Southwest have been centering agents in communities throughout history, demonstrating their spirit of independence, perspective spring from the intersectionality of their voices. 
through implementing various approaches toward gaining knowledge about the women in New Mexico, many unheard stories will come to light as inspiration to the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, next we have Robin Farwell Gavin. She is the curator emeritus of the Spanish Museum of Spanish Colonial Art. And she was a lead curator for over 30 exhibitions concerning the Spanish colonial arts of Mexico and New Mexico. She has many publications, but uh, some of them are Cultural Convergence in New Mexico, Interactions in Art, History, and Archaeology, Converging Streams, Art of the Hispanic and Native American Southwest, and Ceramica y Cultura, the story of Spanish and Mexican Maholica. I turn over, uh, Robin's gonna speak now for a few minutes, uh, 15 minutes. And uh, thank you, Robin. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon and thank you all for coming out. Um, and I wanna thank Meredith and Bethany for putting this panel together. Um, and I'm very excited to hear what everyone has to say. Um, I guess I have to change the slide. <laughs> Thank you. So women, as you might imagine, are rarely mentioned in Spanish colonial documents. And the cultural material that might have belonged to them is now archaeological fragments, if it exists at all. But if we take the documents that do exist, scattered wills as state inventories, keeping in mind that these are, were mostly from wealthy women and inventories of trade goods and match them up with existing objects in museum collections, we can begin to piece together the lives of these women and the multicultural households that they created on the far Northern frontier, blending cultures, objects, and traditions. Most historians date the official founding of the Camino Real, which you see here, um, to 1598 when Don Juan de Oñate and 129 soldiers, their families, which happened to include wives and daughters and native servants, many of whom were also women and children, forged their way north from Zacatecas, Mexico to, to Okeowinge Pueblo. Large segments of the Camino followed already well-established native trails. And from 1598 to 1821, the Camino Real was the main route of communication between colonial New Mexico and the viceregal government in Mexico City. So just to give you a visual sense of traveling on this trail, this is a much later photograph um, dating to about 1875, taken on Palace Avenue looking west. But just imagine traveling in a wagon similar to that for six months, because this journey took at least six months to get here. Um, and half, most of the time you were probably not in the wagon, you were walking because the wagons were so laden with goods and they had no, what do you call it? Um, to, keep it to keep the bouncing, <laughs> shock, 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 shock absorbers, thank you. They had no shock absorbers. So it would have been pretty hard on your spine, I think. Um, the, um, over this route from Mexico City up to Santa Fe came people and goods from all across Spain's vast empire, from Mexico and South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Documents describe New Mexico's 17th century colonists and their servants as an ethnically diverse population. There were, among others, peninsulares or españoles, criollos, mestizos, mulatos, and indios. In New Mexico, these colonists encountered Pueblo and Plains peoples as well, and their lives were inevitably, inextricably intertwined. And this is just to give another visual sense of the terrain that had to be covered. This is La Bajada Escarpment about 1900 before the interstate. This was not an easy journey these, these women took. So who were the women that walked and rode this 1500 mile trail to begin new lives? 
Just a few of their names have been captured. And among them were in 1599, Doña Eufemia, wife of Royal Ensign Diego de Sosa Peñalosa. In 1600, Doña Francisca Galindo and her children traveling with her husband, Captain Antonio Conde de Herrera. Isabel de Olvera, a mulata, a free woman. And she had a notarized statement that said she was a free woman, not bound by marriage or slavery. That's an interesting juxtaposition, I think. In 1659, Doña Teresa de Aguilera y Roche, about whom Fran has written a wonderful um, biography, with her husband, the newly appointed governor. In 1693, Maria Romero, a mulata, the head of a household of six, Juana Ortiz, an Española, a widow and the head of a household of four. Juana Lujan, who had left New Mexico as a child with her parents during the Puebla Revolt and returned to New Mexico now in 1693 as a single parent and also head of the household. In 1695, Manuela Negrete and Francisca Ventura, both mestizas, who participated in that um, resettlement. So what was it that these women chose to bring with them? Some of the items you're gonna see might make you think that, might make you wonder if they thought they were headed to Paris. <laughs> Certainly, many believe that they were off to a better life with their husbands employed by the crown, receiving a salary and the title of Hidalgo and becoming landowners. And they packed accordingly. Among items in inventories are pendientes or pendant earrings, which came in a variety of forms. Gold pendant earrings with emeralds, pearl pendant earrings with faceted jewels, and pendant earrings with fine, fat, and medium-sized pearls. Necklaces, bracelets, and lockets are also listed, as well as a headdress of pearls. In 1565, Spain established trade with Asia by finding a route across the Pacific from Acapulco, Mexico. From Acapulco, Asian goods made their way from the Manila Galleon trade to the remote northern frontier in New Mexico. In a 1764 household inventory, Felipe Tafoya of Santa Fe stated that his wife had a bedspread or colcha made in China, embroidered in silk with a fringe of silk, which probably he was referencing a monton like this, which were um, very large. Some of them were very large shawls, later called piano shawls. The 18th century estates of Gertrudis Armijo and Nicolás Luján both listed kimonos, while a 1758 inventory of trade goods headed north from El Paso del Norte also included three ordinary kimonos. But rebosos were among the most common items of women's clothing listed in inventories, both come at traveling up with the colonists and in later trade inventories. There were ordinary rebosos, fine rebosos, large and small rebosos, silk and cotton rebosos. Other items of women's clothing include hats, shoes, slippers, underskirts and skirts, waistcoats, stockings, shirts, shawls, and petticoats. Doña Francisca Galinda, mentioned earlier, brought with her a dress of crimson satin embroidered in gold and another red satin with sashes and gold trim. Headed from Mexico City to the Santa Fe Presidio store in 1788 were six boxes of fine French women's shoes. Additionally, many yards of fabric and notions are among the inventories. Silk, linen, cotton, calico, or, or Indianea, wool, ribbon, lace, satin, thread, including agave fiber thread, galoon, buckles, and buttons. Goods came from as close as Chihuahua, Mexico City, Puebla, Oaxaca, and the Yucatan, and as far as England, France, Spain, China, and Japan. Other family heirlooms included jewelry boxes and silver dinnerware. And not surprisingly, religious items were numerous in household inventories. Relicarios, like that on the left, and images of saints, Saint Anthony on the right, paintings on copper, on the left and paper prints, both of which were easy to transport. So we have been looking at objects that were perhaps more specific to women, but many women like Juana Luján were widowed or unmarried heads of households. They ran ranches, raised sheep and cattle, protected their homes and families and traded goods alongside men. 
They were curanderas or healers, parteras or midwives, and enjaradoras or plasterers. In fact, my colleague Didi Snow reminded me that um, Fray Benavides in the 1600s, um, who, who as a written memorial said that it was women and children that helped him build the first chapel of San Miguel here in Santa Fe. They were just as industrious and maybe even more so than their male counterparts. And these are just two of the items listed in the estate inventory of Juana Luján, who when she died in 1762 was a wealthy and socially prominent woman. It was a hacksaw and a bit uh, for bridal. She also owned saddles, a musket, a sword and shield, axes, hammers, drills, chisels, branding irons, plows, and an anvil. I'm not sure if she was the one using it, but she did have it. Um, whoops. Once in New Mexico, women had to quickly adapt. As they worked to recreate their lives in the frontier, they incorporated both the familiar and the foreign creating hybrid multicultural spaces that were ultimately uniquely New Mexican. And on the left is the Plaza del Cerro in Chimayo, which was constructed in the mid 18th century. And on the right, a plan of the Jaquez House um, in Rio Riba County that's from Beverly Spears' um, American Adobe's book. And if you've read Donna Usner's book called Sabino's Map, he talks about the Plaza del Cerro in Chimayo and um, this plaza would have been inhabited by multiple families. Uh, so families might have two or three rooms. They might have the corner of the plaza. There were, there were various configurations. House construction varied widely, mostly depending upon economic class, from one or two rooms to the 24-room estate of Juana Luján near San Ildefonso. Even with just a few rooms, one room was usually designated the sala, and within this, there was a space often called, or that has been referred to as the estrado, used primarily by women. And if you see this, the room that's listed as a living room was basically the sala. This is a reconstruction of the Palace of the Governors in 1659 to um, 1653 when Doña Teresa was living there. And this is by Jose Esquivel. And you see in the lower right, this right, the Sala de Estrado. The earliest and perhaps the only mention of an Estrado in New Mexico occurred in the mid 17th century, when Doña Teresa and her husband made their home in the palace for two short years before their arrest by the Inquisition. However, there's evidence that the use of this space persisted up until the mid 19th century. Got to get in the right place. The Estrado, this is um, a reconstructed Estrado from the Museo de Artes Decorativas in Madrid, I think is the source of this. The Estrado is typically described as an area in one end of a room that was partitioned from the rest of the room by hanging textiles or tooled and painted leather curtains. And this, you can see the Flemish tapestry in the background in the Oriental, probably an Oriental rug on the bottom. There's a I forgot my pointer, but there's a writing chest in the lower left. There are cushions, there's low tables, an incense burner and um, candlesticks. A Muslim tradition, the Estrada was introduced into Spain by Islamic North Africans. By the 17th century, when New Mexico was settled, the Estrada had been fully adopted into Spanish custom and had become a primary area of entertainment for women. Here they might sit and sew or embroider, drink chocolate and converse. Humbler homes also sometimes included petates de estrado or straw mats that would be used in a designated area of the room, indicating the space was used regardless of social or economic class. Oops. Although not mentioned in other I think this skipped. No, it didn't, I'm sorry. Although not mentioned in other New Mexican colonial documents, the custom of the Estrado appears to have continued into the 19th century in New Mexico. Both Susan Shelby McGoffin in 1846 and W.W.H. Davis in 1853 mentioned that salas were often divided into two spaces, one area covered with rugs and colchones or cushions where women typically gathered. 
One particularly interesting item in Dona Teresa's household was a used painted elk skin to go around the estrado. Paintings on hide, it's seen here, are one of the earliest cross-cultural art forms in colonial New Mexico. Brain tanned leather was a principal trade item between New Mexican vecinos and the Plains tribes. Used as canvases, the paintings here were done in the European style, often copied from European prints. As seen on the right, this is the crucifixion is taken from a print by Peter Paul Rubens that was distributed by the Catholic Church. And on the left is actually um, a detail of Segesur II, which depicts actual events of the, v the Via Sur expedition in 1720. And the paints, with the exceptions of indigo and cochineal, were made from local plants and minerals, which Pueblo peoples undoubtedly taught the Spanish settlers to make. Mantas woven by Pueblo Indians listed in other inventories as hangings may also have taken the place of screens and tapestries that were common around the estrados of Southern New Spain. Instead of the Flemish tapestries and tooled Cordovan leather curtains that were common in Spain, the New Mexico estrado took on a character all its own. Other items that might've been found in the estrado aside from cushions and rugs included a writing desk such as this from Michoacan, and a chest for storing linens or clothing. Chests like the one pictured were made with European tools and woodworking techniques, but instead of the traditional Spanish designs of rosettes and pomegranates, the local origin is indicated by geometric motifs much more indigenous in aesthetic and very similar to Plains Indian parflesh designs. Historic documents show that chocolate, a product of the Americas, was a popular trade item in New Mexico, and that Doña Teresa was accustomed to taking chocolate in her quarters. Chocolate cups in New Spain were typically referred to as jicaras, one of which was also among the possessions of Doña Teresa. These jicaras, pictured here, were excavated from 17th century mission sites in New Mexico. Chocolateras, in which the drink was frothed on the right, were also part of the typical colonial chocolate service. And in the 18th century, the popular manzarinas were added to this service, which is the saucer on the left with an attached lip so that the cup would not um, spill. Juana Lujan also had vessels in which to make chocolate and a pound of chocolate in her larder. In 1788, the Santa Fe Presidio store received three boxes of ordinary chocolate and eight boxes of luxury chocolate for sale. Pottery was also brought to the frontier as part of household furnishings, including Mayolica or Talavera made in Mexico on the left and Chinese porcelains on the right. Chinese porcelain fragments have been found at the Palace of the Governors and on other archeological sites in New Mexico dating to the 1600s. And although Spanish settlers brought some ceramic items with them, it was obviously difficult to transport these across the trail. Once here, some made their own vessels, but Pueblo peoples were accomplished potters already, and the settlers relied on their expertise for most household needs. Pueblo potters also adapted their styles to fit Hispano expectations and uses. And these on the left um, are pieces excavated from San Jose de las Huertas near Placitas and show plates and um, candlesticks. And then on the right is a a mug with a handle and none of these forms were um, encountered before Spanish contact. So the forms of men, many of the pottery, the pottery changed forms with Spanish arrival. By the end of the colonial period, many of household religious images from Spain and Mexico were replaced by locally made images. These images reflected a new aesthetic and style, one that was far removed from the academic Baroque paintings and sculpture of Spain and Mexico that we saw earlier. This new style was flat, two-dimensional, with an emphasis on color and pattern, a style that reflected a New Mexican aesthetic rather than a European one. And um, on the left, you can see an image of St. Barbara, which traditionally um, in European imagery, she is crowned, but here she wears a feather headdress. Nuevo Mexicanas gathered all these diverse items and traditions together from around the world, from Spain, Asia, 
Arab North Africa, Mexico, Peru, and their Pueblo and Plains neighbors, and created multicultural households that were distinctly and uniquely New Mexican. There are no colonial portraits that I'm aware of, of women that I'm aware of, but the faces of these two women, Candelaria Cordova Romero and Martina Trujillo Romero from 1900 in Cordova, New Mexico, say it all. They were a remarkable woman on a remarkable journey. This sense of adventure, tenacity, determination, and the ability to adapt continues to this day, as you'll see in the following presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Very, very interesting. And most of you know that it's uh, Spanish colonial weekend this weekend, and there'll be lots of things on display downtown and at the museum. So I invite you to find out more. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Francis Levine, Dr. Francis Levine, ethno historian. She just retired from the Missouri Historical Society as the president, and she was the former director of the New Mexico History Museum. Fran has written many books and articles. Uh, she is the author and co-editor of several award-winning books, including Our Prayers Are in This Place, Pecos Pueblo Identity Over the Centuries, Through the Lens, Creating Santa Fe, Telling, uh, telling New Mexico a New History, All Trails Lead to Santa Fe, and Doña Teresa Confronts the Spanish Inquisition, a 17th century New Mexico drama. Crossings, Women on the Santa Fe Trail will be published in 2023 by the University of Kansas Press. She'll tell us more, St. Louis and Santa Fe. Oops. Let me move this closer. Thank you so much, Meredith, and to my esteemed colleagues. I mean, boy, you would think that Robin and I had written these together because they dovetail uh, pretty well. I am so happy to be here at this end of the trail. And I have to say, if I were to retitle that book, it might now, now say, instead of all trails lead to Santa Fe, all trails lead to St. Louis, Santa Fe, and Chihuahua. Um, because we really have to see the way in which these communities were connected. I am gonna take a minute here to figure out, uh, see, I'm used to having a touch screen. I don't know how to do the, this one I know, but how do you do the text? Don't worry about it. I'm just gonna make it up. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. This last year, we celebrated the 200th anniversary of the uh, opening of the Santa Fe Trail. But I like to say, what were we really celebrating? The 200th anniversary of what? Um, because it's really, I have been advocating for a long time that we use the Santa Fe Trail as a reframing of American history, that we really look at the connection between um, French colonists in the St. Louis area and, uh, or in the confluence area, the confluence of the Mississippi Mississippi and the Missouri River, and look at the Spanish and Mexican and Native American people at um, the Santa Fe end of the trail. As you drive across the Santa Fe Trail now, you see a lot of markers like the one on the left of um, women in sunbonnets trailing children by the hand, carrying a baby and marching forth uh, by the side of the wagon. When we did the reenactment last year, of the opening of the Santa Fe Trail, we had uh, probably one of the first times that we really reenacted um, William Becknell arriving in Santa Fe, not with a wagon, but on a, on a mule. And he was the first one to arrive uh, with a small group from Franklin, New Mexico. He was not um, a fur trader. He was really a debtor. And he had come to uh, New Mexico to satisfy a debt of about $200, which I could run up and target in a heartbeat. Um, but of course there was a debtor's prison and he, um, he, left, uh, he left Missouri, Franklin, Missouri, headed for the Rocky Mountains to trade for furs. 
Uh, how much he knew about Mexican independence is a little bit up in the air, has been the subject of some speculation. But he arrived in New Mexico and was welcomed by Facundo Melgares, who is the um, who is the governor at the time, who had also been the um, uh, Spanish military officer who arrested um, Zebulon Pike in uh, uh, earlier in the century. There had been many, many attempts to connect St. Louis and Santa Fe, um, but. One of the questions that we have to ask is where does the Santa Fe Trail begin and where does it end? And if you talk to most people, I'm going to make the point that the Santa Fe Trail begins on the um, on the banks of the Mississippi River. And people will say, oh, no, oh, no, it starts in Independence or it starts in Westport, Missouri, or it starts in Franklin, Missouri. And where does it end? Does it end in Taos? Does it end in Santa Fe? And I'm going to make the point that it connects with exactly what Robin was talking about. And that is it connects Santa Fe is the nexus between the Santa Fe Trail and the Camino Real. This is really a hard thing to accept, y'all. But I don't think Santa Fe was the end point of the Santa Fe Trail. I don't think it is what sustained the Santa Fe Trail. And uh, really, the ultimate goal was to link the, these uh, global trade networks from the materials that came in through the confluence region across the continent through the Santa Fe Trail to connect to exactly what Robin was talking about, the world expanse of the Camino Real. On the north, Taos really was its own gateway into the Plains Indian and Pueblo country and to a fur trade that really um, encouraged the trade that became the Santa Fe Trail. Um, so it's uh, important for us to take pride in Santa Fe, but know that we were not ultimately the goal of Santa Fe Trail traders. This is one of my favorite uh, pictures. I, when people ask me how I got to St. Louis, I wanna say that I put my car in reverse on the Santa Fe Plaza and just, traveled east on the Santa Fe Trail until I reached Missouri. When I saw this photograph, the one on the left is a Thomas um, uh, Easterly daguerreotype of the St. Louis Wharf in 1853. And those uh, steamboats are loaded with crates and barrels and boxes. And at different periods of time, the, um, the uh, riverbanks of the, uh, in St. Louis those materials were coming in from Philadelphia, from New York, from the upper, um, from uh, upper New England. And of course, coffee and enslaved people were coming from the South, from uh, New Orleans and further South. And it was in, San, in St. Louis that they were loaded onto wagons and brought across the trail. Now the photo on the right is one of the earliest photos that we have of Santa Fe. And that is, was taken in front of the Palace of the Governors before it was uh, tarted up in the 1870s. And it was a little planar structure there. And that's the Ellsberg and Anberg wagons in front of the palace. And I have to say that it, that photo in 1867, those are where the boxes and bales um, came across the Santa Fe Trail. Well, what went back to St. Louis uh, in many cases was, was hard cash, Mexican silver, uh, mules, and uh, furs. And um, the cash was most, most important in St. Louis. St. Louis had, um, you know, Mexican independence is what opened the trade between New Spain and the U.S., but it was a trade with a much longer history and uh, in a couple slides, I'm going to tell you about who, some of the women who are in the book Crossings and really that trade between um, the Confluence region and the Rocky Mountains, Santa Fe and northern Mexico really goes back uh, right to the Comanchero trade and to the uh, trade fairs at Taos Pueblo in the early 18th century. Missouri traders became very interested in uh, New Mexico and Mexico after Mexican independence. Spain, of course, didn't allow trade between the US and Mexico. And uh, 
uh, Missouri suffered a tremendous banking collapse in 1819. And that is where uh, William Becknell ran up his uh, debt. Um, by about, by the early 1830s, New Mexican traders really dominated the trade. And there's some uh, tremendous analysis of the trade goods that were going back and forth. And New Mexicans may have been not been there in the first um, part of the trade, but I have to say that the Missouri traders who came in were extremely interested in uh, New Mexico hides, New Mexico, and, and also meeting New Mexican women. So this is a, a illustration of St. Louis in 1841 by John Casper Weil. And uh, he had painted a number of urban landscapes of Philadelphia, Cincinnati, St. Louis, uh, Iowa. And these are all things that when I saw them, I realized just how important um, many cultures were on the Santa Fe Trail. If you look at this, and I don't have a pointer either. Uh, there's not one on here, no. So if you look at the uh, far left of the slide, what you'll see is an African-American man wheeling a cart um, along that, along the wharf. And then on the wharf, you see a little house. And then down to its right, you see a Native American couple who are also there on the, uh, on the wharf trading. And I was standing on that surface right now, that surface, that whole area is beneath the arch in St. Louis. And I was standing on the bank and I could just imagine this scene coming to life. And the wagons that are in that scene were made, a lot of the wagons that came across the Santa Fe Trail were made in St. Louis. So I kind of, um, shock people when I say in, in Missouri, no, the Santa Fe Trail did not begin in Franklin. Franklin was a great crossing of the Missouri River and independence for sure was the head of the land, um, of the land crossing, but it was not the beginning of the Santa Fe Trail. So that was just to set a little context of the geography that I'm gonna move us a little further east. And um, these are some of the women that I've written about in the book Crossings. And uh, the first woman I wrote about is uh, Maria Rosa Villalpando Sale de Lejoie. I'm not gonna talk about her today. I just wanted to say her name. <laughs> and Maria Rosa Villalpando was um, abducted from Ranchos de Taos in, on August 4th, in fact, of 1760. And she was taken by the Comanches, traded to the Pawnees, and then acquired by one of the French um, uh, uh, settlers of St. Louis. There's a lot of uh, interesting folklore about Maria Rosa Villalpando, um, but there is also a lot of context to the uh, trafficking of women and children as part of the early uh, trade between New Mexico and the Plains. I'm not gonna talk to, about Maria Rosa, but she reminds me frequently in my dreams that the entire book should have been about her. That these other women are interesting, but they are not her. Um, the woman on the far left in the upper corner is Wanibi or Singing Grass. And she was a Arapaho wife of Kit Carson. His daughter, Prairie Flower, or Adeline, uh, is another woman that I write about. And um, it's really through Adeline and uh, Kit Carson's story that I started writing about schoolgirls who were sent from Santa Fe to St. Louis for schooling. We're not going to talk about that today either. Um, Carmel Benavides Robido is uh, a woman who, on the upper right, we have the will of Antoine Robideau. And Robideau was one of the first of the French traders who came to uh, New Mexico in 1829. And he came with five of his brothers. His name is widely known throughout the Rocky Mountains, throughout the Great Basin. And when he and his brother Louis came to, Saint, uh, to uh, Santa Fe in 1829, they pretty quickly took up with women here in New Mexico. And uh, Antoine Robideau 
married Carmel Benavides. And Carmel Benavides was from the family that lived in the building that became 109 East Palace. You with me? So it's, I mean, what an amazing confluence of historical figures uh, that happen. And that is the will is a very important document because some people have argued that Robidoux never married um, Carmel Benavides because nobody could find a, a document in the church records. Well, whatever that says, I'm not sure. But in that will, he refers to Carmel as his um, as his dearest wife, Carmeleta, and he leaves and entrusts her with all his property. We're not going to talk about her today either. We're going to quickly go through these women and then to settle on the one particular day. That register of a 18 um, of an 1850s, uh, 1850s census of one of the counties west of St. Louis may include Charlotte Green, who was one of the African-American women that I wrote about on the Santa Fe Trail. There were many more African-American women than we know by name. We're not going to talk about Charlotte today, except for one minute, uh, but she's fascinating. And the woman on the far right, oh, the, the register is of uh, some items that Carmel Benavides purchased here in Santa Fe. Carmel Benavides probably did six crossings of the Santa Fe Trail. And I did that by tracing where she was making purchases in St. Louis or the area around Ferguson and Florissen, actually, where she was making purchases and signing for them in St. Louis or um, St. Joseph and, and in Santa Fe. So that's one of the purchases she did in Santa Fe. On the far right is, um, uh, is a woman who we're, I'm going to talk a bit about, Julia Arch. That is not Julia Archibald Holmes, but it's very important that you notice what she's wearing because that's her greatest legacy on the Santa Fe Trail is what she was wearing. And I'm going to tell you today that her bloomers are the least interesting thing about her. So just... Uh, once I got started, I started reading documents much more deeply to understand where women were when they were on the trail. And I'm going to talk about the moment that surrounds Susan Shelby McGoffin's diary. Susan Shelby McGoffin is there in the center. She was the 17-year-old bride of Samuel McGoffin, uh, brother to James McGoffin, who is often said to have um, arranged the surrender of New Mexico um, with Manuel Armijo. And uh, Susan, she was really a beautiful writer. And I have to say, I said in the newspaper article that we gave Susan a, a pass for many, many years. Her diary was published in 1926. And the craziest thing about it is the woman who was the editor was the librarian at Missouri Historical Society, and I was occupied her office in Santa Fe. Uh, so Stella Drum edited the diary of Susan Shelby McGoffin. She published it in 1926. And some people have said she buried the diary under an avalanche of annotations so that it would be taken seriously. It's a great document, but I have, um, I have a little more jaundiced eye about Susan than I used to. I was charmed by Susan, just like everyone else. And she probably used Josiah Gregg's um, 1839 uh, publication, Commerce of the Prairies, to, to really um, guide her in what she recorded. And she records a lot about crossing the trail. Now, a lot of the women that I talk about and a lot of the women who produce diaries and um, materials on the Santa Fe Trail often act as though they were the only women on the trail. And many times they were not, but we do have their voice. On the left is Stephen Watts Carney, who of course led the, um, led the Army of the West into New Mexico. He was assisted in translation of the Oath of Allegiance to the United States by Antoine Robito. Uh, husband of uh, Carmel Benavides. And Susan McGoffin was probably the, is the only woman, it seems, who came with the Army of the West, who recorded her own memoirs, but there were several other women. She was accompanied by her uh, enslaved woman, Jane. 
that is not a daguerreotype of Jane, okay? But that is a daguerreotype of uh, Louisa, who was um, the uh, enslaved nurse of the Haywood family in New Orleans. And um, I, I chose that because we have so few images of African-American women. And um, she is referred to in our documents as the nurse Louisa. She was 24 years old at about the time that this portrait was made. We have no portrait of Jane, who was Susan Shelby McGoffin's enslaved woman. Um, but when I saw this portrait of, um, of Louisa, I decided to dig deeper into what Susan said about Jane in her diary. And um, she refers to Jane several times as her companion, sometimes as her servant, sometimes as her nurse, sometimes as her, um, her, her companion in this great adventure. But what I became very aware of, that the tone of McGoffin's diary changes as she crosses the country. And part of it is, that she's learning more about war as she crosses. And uh, she's only in Santa Fe a very sh short time. They arrive at the end of August of 1846 and they leave at the end of 1846. But on September 23rd, 1846, she attended um, a ball that Stephen Watts Carney gave in the palace of the governors. And it was at that moment that Jane, and Susan Shelby McGoffin and, um, um, and Doña Tules, Gertrudis Barcelo, were all in the same place. And uh, there were also two other women. Um, ugh, what is her name? Uh, Soledad Abreu and um, Eliza, can't remember her last name. But there are at least four women and probably many more. These are Anglo-American women who had come across with the Army of the West. And what a pity that the only person who left her written memories of it was Susan. But it's okay. We can use it. We can use it. Susan um, uses the moment of entering Santa Fe. Actually, I'm going to read you something that a man wrote about entering Santa Fe. Is that okay? This is uh, Richard Smith Elliott, whose journals, he was a journalist for the Daily Revelry. And I'm just gonna read you uh, something that he said that really resonates about women at the moment of American conquest. He is marching into the city. Uh, he's not here on the very day that Stephen Watts Carney is here, but he, is, he comes in several days later and as the American flag was raised, he said, the cannon boomed in glorious national salute from the hill up by Fort Marcy. The pent up emotions of many of the women could be suppressed no longer and a sigh of commiseration, even for causeless distress, escaped from many a manly breast as the wail of grief rose above the din of the horse's tread and reached our ears from the depth of the gloomy looking buildings on every hand. Whew. That's some purple prose, but I love it. Uh, and he has, his journal is really marvelous. He intended to write a biography of Doña Tules. And I have to say that Richard Smith Elliott is one of the few writers who, um, who really seems focused on understanding what American conquest needs. So Susan McGoffin and Doña, uh, Doña Tules and Jane are all at this dance on uh, September 23rd, 1846. I can assure you that they were not all in the same room, but Susan remembers seeing Doña Tulis and she records in her diary, her false teeth and her false hair, that she was an imposing presence. Um, she was a stately dame of a certain age, the possessor of a, of a portion of that shrewd sense and fascinating manner necessary to allure the wayward and inexperienced youth to the hall of final ruin. It's such a good time reading these. So uh, in many of the journals, the focus of the writers is on New Mexican women's external appearance. The fact that they um, are, Susan becomes quite uh, quite an object of curiosity. And the weeks that she's in here in town, people visit her in the home where she's living near uh, the church. 
And the women are all in New Mexico are studying her clothing. And within a few days, they're sewing their own versions of her clothing. Um, but New Mexican women were quite exotic to American soldiers. They were, uh, they smoked cigarettes. They wore low cut blouses. They uh, didn't wear hats. They wore rebosos. And so there's a lot of focus on that external appearance. But there's um, this, this uh, Harper's illustration of, of Doña Tules. I'm gonna tell you that it's my belief that even on her worst day, she didn't look this bad. I, I just don't see it. She was one of the wealthiest women here in St. Louis. And um, she's recently been described and analyzed by Chicana author, uh, Ana Nogar and Dina Gonzalez, and also Chicano folklorist, Enrique La Madrid, as a mujerota, as a, a capable and enterprising woman. And she used her strength of the moment of American colonization uh, that, that she was the banker to many of the American troops. Um, and she played her role in both um, negotiating and, uh, and aiding and abetting and building her fortune on American, um, on American, um, the American military. But she also kept that strength and kept that, uh, that, um, that community focus. I think one of the things that many Americans miss is the, um, is the way in which Americans, uh, uh, New Mexican women challenged American views of femininity and a woman's place. And um, the other thing, probably most importantly, that when Stephen Watts Carney gave his speech claiming New Mexico and saying he would not take a pepper or an onion without paying for it, he didn't say out loud, but should have, but I'm gonna reduce your women's rights um, by putting women in their place and taking their property rights. So a very significant moment of change that is ignored in many, many of the uh, writings about that period. Again, we're gonna go back to Richard Smith Elliott. And in the spring of 1847, by which time the, uh, the discipline of American troops was absolutely dissolute. And um, there were many people who were, who, were, uh, who were leaving the military, not completing their, their duties. He wrote something really quite remarkable. He said, we have, it is true, paid them for all we have taken, except the grass, which our stock have eaten, but the merchants already have the money. And though calico and muslin and trumpery and rings and beads, etc., and more profuse abundance than ever before, yet the consequence will be empty stomachs and aching hearts. I have no doubt whatever that if they were able, they, meaning the New Mexicans, would cut, the thro would cut our throats with a hearty goodwill. So I, I, um, I was really quite taken by Richard Smilt Elliott's very detailed discussion of the losses that American conquest brought. Uh, Susan doesn't talk about any of that. She doesn't really know about it, but the next woman I'm gonna talk about really does, and that's Julia Archibald Holmes. Um, I guess we're having an emergency. We must be having a flash. It's an amber alert, thank you. Um, uh, Julia Archibald Holmes is a fascinating woman. In Colorado, she's very well known for supposedly being one of the first women to climb Pikes Peak in 1858. And uh, her journals of climbing Pikes Peak with a 17 pound pack on her back with her husband, James, they are just beautiful writings. And she writes from the various camps uh, uh, up the side of Pikes Peak and just gorgeous writing. Julia um, had traveled a thousand miles in an ox cart and on foot from Lawrence, Kansas to the gold fields of Colorado. And in that summer of 1858 is when she wrote back to her mother. She was raised in Lawrence, Kansas, which was a community of abolitionists. And she was a staunch abolitionist and suffragist. So that outfit that she wore was really about her political views because the, the American, um, it's called the American Reform Outfit. And it was a symbol of freedom. And let me tell you what she writes about it. 
uh, because she was traveling in a wagon train with one other woman who was not a suffragist. She was not an abolitionist. And Julia thought that she was a poor excuse for a woman. Um, and the other woman refused to associate with Julia because she was um, so strong-willed. She said, as, so Julia says, as I was cooking our dinner, some of the men crowded around our wagon, gazing sometimes at the stove, but oftener on my dress, which did not surprise me, for I presume some of them had never seen such a thing, such a costume before. I wore a calico dress reaching a little below the knee, pants of the same, Indian moccasins on my feet, and on my head a hat. However much it lacked in taste, I found it to be beyond value in comfort and convenience, as it gave me freedom to roam at pleasure in search of flowers and other curiosities. She, um, she uh, tried to stand watch at night with, uh, with, uh, her, with other men. She wanted her own duty. She um, wrote for a magazine called The Sybil, and she was a very strong and eloquent voice. After she climbed Pikes Peak, she and her husband sent, spent the winter of, fifth, excuse me, I mean, used to writing about the 1580s, not the 1850s, 1858 to 1859 in Taos, where she was a teacher. Then she, they moved on to Fort Union. And finally, in July of 1860, they came to Santa Fe, where her husband, James, was nominated as the keeper of records for the territorial governor. They could not have chosen a worse time to arise in Santa Fe. And part of it was that Santa Fe Territorial Legislature in February of 1859 had passed the Territorial uh, Slave Code. And um, a lot of people don't know about the Slave Code in New Mexico, but it's a really rather, I'm gonna just say it, it's a revolting document. And uh, James and Julia became ardent they really were speaking out against the state legislature and against the governor because of their embrace of slavery. And it was a sort of cynical moment in New Mexico history. Do I sound bitter? I'm not trying to. Um, um, uh, so uh, Julia and James began to write newspaper articles about um, the cynicism of the uh, government here in New Mexico, trying so hard to align themselves with the South in order to promote statehood. That's, you know, like taking many years of history and packing it down. But I think that um, we need to remember Julia for so much more than what she wore. She and her mother were both, um, uh, were both um, correspondents. Uh, to the Sybil, which was the feminist magazine. She also wrote for uh, poetry. She, James and she uh, separated during the Civil War and he led two troops, uh, two um, columns of colored troops in Tennessee. She kind of floated from family member to family member. They went to Washington DC after the war and um, he tried, uh, to really silence her. Ultimately, she um, they divorced, but at her divorce hearing, this woman who was such a phenomenal writer uh, and speaker was not allowed to speak about the beatings she'd endured, the, um, the way he had seduced her sister. It was a really ugly divorce. Her brother had to defend her and had to make her argument for her. It's a pretty horrible end, but she then went to work for the Governor, government as a translator of Spanish documents. So it's, uh, they're just amazing stories, these really strong women who we don't hear about. It's so much more important. Um, you know, Western roads and trails, particularly the Santa Fe Trail, was a great catalyst for change. Uh, reframing the history of the trail through the experiences of, of women, Native Americans, Black and Hispanic um, people, gives us a much greater perspective on American history. Um, and I think that these cross-cultural families that developed from the Santa Fe Trail alliances, those are, you know, I meet people in St. Louis all the time and they'll say, oh, my family, I'm from the Turley family. And I say, oh, you're from Taos. And they say, no, I'm from St. Louis. Or I'm from the Bent family. And I say, oh, you're from, um, you're from Taos. No, I'm from St. Louis. And the, the connections between Santa Fe and St. Louis 
and these marvelous families that grew up, these extended families and family networks uh, are, are really, um, I think a fascinating view of American history. And I think a way of teaching American history that's much more appealing uh, to kids. And I think that um, it's also good for, for us when we teach American history is to really also talk about the loss of rights that came in New Mexico from the conquest. Um, I have so many people to thank and uh, I want to thank all of you for coming and Meredith and Lisa for inviting me. Thank you. If you see what I mean, there are just so many stars out there. Uh, we're only getting glimpses of a few today. Uh, we're going to have a change of pace and uh, I'm going to introduce Nicolasa Chavez, who is the deputy historian, state historian for the state of New Mexico. And she's a 14th generation New Mexican. She's a performance artist. Her programs and exhibitions focus on the rich multicultural heritage of New Mexico and the connection between New Mexico and the Spanish speaking world. Uh, chocolate was mentioned a little earlier. She did a fabulous exhibit at the um, International Folk Art Museum a few years ago. She could talk on that and a number of other things, but uh, we're gonna have a, a different glimpse of New Mexico. And she's gonna be talking about the flamenco in just in, uh, which I had to be corrected on. I thought it was like old world Spain. Uh, and found out from, from Nicolasa that uh, our most famous flamenco artist, Maria Benitez, was from Taos Pueblo. Um, so anyway, we're going to learn more. Uh, Nicolasa has authored this, The Spirit of Flamenco, From Spain to New Mexico, A Century of Masters, the NEA National Heritage Fellows of New Mexico, it's a New Mexico Book Award winner, and she performs and conducts lectures and demonstrations on the history of flamenco, Spanish dance, and Argentine tango. So uh, one of the other things that I wasn't aware of is that um, students across New Mexico are learning flamenco, and they also have a at UN, UNM, a whole department, a whole major um, for flamenco. So anyway, we have lots to learn and uh, take it away, Nicolasa. Thank you, Meredith. And oh, this is definitely everybody can hear. Um, I am so excited to be um, here with all of these fabulous women, fabulous speakers, and hearing about this legacy. Um, there's been words that are used about women coming up the Camino Real with this ability to adapt and this freedom we had here. Women were um, owners of land and property and business dealings and also helping support the U.S. Army by lending money to them and different things. And New Mexican flamencas fall very in line. Flamencas in general do in that category when we talk about um, again, Fran mentioned women being looked at from the outside, um, Americans coming in and noticing New Mexican women. The same thing happens in Spain with the Gitana and Gypsy women of Andalusia of Southern Spain who um, appear in black and white postcards and photographs for tourists at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th. And you can also go back further to Prosper Merdimé's book on Carmen, which later becomes the opera by Bizet. And Carmen, of course, is a very romanticized image by somebody from outside of Spain, outside of Andalusia, of what they think a you know Spanish temptress would be, uh, so to speak. And of course, um, there are many images like that in New Mexico. We know at the beginning of the 20th century, um, New Mexico is very popular for tourists to come. And of course, anthropologists, artists, all sorts of people are coming here, but also tourism is big. And we, um, New Mexico had created, there's this tricultural tri myth that happens where we have the Hispanic culture, one culture, you know, mytholo mythology wise. Um, and then we have native culture, right? 
And then we have the Anglo culture, but really we know there are many, many, many different cultures within that realm, but this picture kind of speaks to that. And one of the women in the picture is Betty Serna Cardenas, who when I was working on the exhibition in the book, um, um, she had a treasure trove of personal items and still had the original photograph from when she modeled for it. This is a photograph for the USO in 1947. Um, Betty grew up in Santa Fe, a multi-generational family. And at the time, not just um, Spanish dance, but Mexican dance and many ethnic dances from all over were really popular, not only in New Mexico, but in the United States, there was a rise in learning Hungarian folk dances and Russian folk dances. And you can look at recital programs and catalogs of dance studios around the country and see this kind of rise in popularity of all these dances. In New Mexico, um, further back, again, um, in Susan Shelby McGoffin's diary and Josiah Gregg's diary, the word fandango appears. Of course, they say it fandango. Um, now, uh, it, before the pandemic, it was a movie ticket um, <laughs> site to order movie tickets. But fandangos are actually an ancient um, song form in Spain. It was a regional folkloric song. There's about 150 versions of the fandangos but that music came into New Mexico along with other Spanish music. However, the other myth we have is that the Spanish conquistadores and colonists were accompanied with you know, flamenco dancers and castanets. Not true. Um, flamenco, as we know it today, developed much later. It has many ancient origins um, all the way back to um, Gades, which was an, a Roman capital in Spain. We know there's references to bronze castanets, um, women dancers from the Iberian Peninsula were sent back to Rome to entertain. And then the roots continue. We have Sephardic Jewish music in Spain. We have 800 years of Muslim rule. All these musical traditions, along with regional folk music in Spain, feed into flamenco. And it's a multicultural heritage. And New Mexicans are multicultural people. We can trace family names back to Spain. We can we have cousins in Mexico, as Robin mentioned. People left after the Pueblo Revolt. Some returned to New Mexico. Some said, I'm never going back there. Stayed in Mexico um, and mixed with cultures here. Um, so at the beginning of the 20th century, we see a rise in popularity of of Spanish dance and Mexican dance. This is also the time when mariachi music really develops and filters into New Mexico as well. So certain things that we see when we celebrate fiestas throughout the state and local um, um, annual feast days, we have traditional New Mexican music. We'll very often have Pueblo dances and different dances and Matachinas dances. But then today we also see mariachi and flamenco. Um, it's this weekend, Spanish market weekend, usually see flamenco and mariachi as well. And I grew up watching these things, and, but they are newcomers in our cultural history. But um, Betty Serna Cardenas was a native Santa Fean who grew up passionately um, dancing. A lot of New Mexican families, music and dance was, oh, I'm pointing at the screen and not the computer. Yeah, I guess that'll work better. <laughs> Next slide. Yes, but um, most families, if you had um, gatherings um, in the home or if you lived way out in the campo, there would be bailes and dances that took place in dance halls or whoever had the largest sala or living room that Robin was showing, you'd invite the community in. And those would develop into annual fiestas and ferias, which Many cultures have similar things where people will dress up in traditional costume and come out. Um, early fiestas in Santa Fe. This is a photo from 1919. I almost said 2019. That's wrong. 1919. And you will see women dressed in Spanish shawls, which Robin had shown a manton de Manila. Again, the Asian influence in our culture and dress. And on your right is my great aunt, Nora Chavez and her twin Cuate dressed for the fiesta. And back in the day, um, Robin also mentioned kimonos in the wills, which I love because fiestas was historically a time when you did not leave the house without dressing up. 
people don't do it as much anymore, but um, there are accounts of women wearing kimonos, um, Japanese women that were at the fiesta wore their kimono, the china poblana, which is a traditional costume from Mexico, people would wear that. So you'll see here, cuate is dressed more in a, a Mexican style and my great aunt Nora is more in a romanticized image again of the Spanish woman with her mantilla. And we know women didn't wear the mantilla every day. They were for special occasions. And of course the fiesta is a special occasion. And um, this just shows how important music was to celebration and culture and heritage. And I kind of wish I could travel back in time and go to fiestas in the forties because that is the rooftop of the La Fonda Hotel with the full on orchestra and mariachi band and people dancing. You can see Chino po women dressed in their Chino Poblana on the rooftop. And I just think the La Fonda should let all of us locals invade and <laughs> party on the rooftop again. But again, this is um, Betty Serna Cardenas, who in her family, her brother um, studied ethnomusicology. She studied dance. She went on to study with the San Francisco Ballet. And while she was away, um, she became Fiesta Queen in 1947 and made the cover of New Mexico Music magazine. And I think one of the things that's really um, telling here is that it was a big music was a big deal. We don't often talk about who's playing at Fiesta this year, but it used to be published in New Mexico Music magazine. And of course, she of course made the cover of that magazine. Her when you when you talk to her, she was doing Spanish dance, classical music, regional folk dances. She didn't really know flamenco at the time. What is known as traditional flamenco, which is separate from um, classical dance and escuela bolera, which developed more as court dances and do have balletic elements to them. She got her first glimpses of flamenco studying with the Concino family in San Francisco. The most famous of the Concinos was Rita Hayworth. Um, a lot of Spanish families had immigrated and come to the United States during and after the Spanish Civil War. And we had an influx of Spanish immigrants and a lot of them were teaching the traditional dances. We can change. Um, I include two Spanish women here from Spain because they were really emblematic in shaping um, the careers of several male dancers. Um, we can't only talk about the women, but one of our New Mexico's very own was Vicente Romero, who was one of three American men that um, joined the company of Pilar Lopez, who is on the right. On your left is Encarnacion Lopez y Julves, La Argentinita. And both of these, um, La Argentinita died really young. She's responsible largely for discovering famous Jose Greco, who was actually from Brooklyn, New York, um, but she just um, had noticed him in a nightclub dancing there. Um, within three years of dancing with her, he was her leading man. Greco wrote a letter of introduction for Vicente Romero, who ended up in Pilar Lopez's company. Pilar Lopez ran the company for about uh, three or four decades after La Argentinita died, and they were sisters. So um, those two men, of course, um, had their own companies and toured the U.S. and brought in many um, women dancers into their companies. Um, we can switch slides again. Um, so again, these companies would tour. My slides are backwards, so we'll um, do this one in the next one. The next one shows Jose Greco as he came to visit Albuquerque. But a lot of the early dances in New Mexico, again, this is Clarita Garcia de Aranda, on the left, who is the mother of Evan Sinia Sandoval, who I will talk about later and the one who started the program at UNM. And on the right is Lily the Castillo. And these are both in the 50s. Um, Lily is dancing, again, what she calls Spanish dance or what she said they were doing off flamencado style dancing back in the 50s. And Clarita was doing um, classical and a bit of flamenco. She also sang and handed down the singing tradition within her family. Um, Lily was in a group called the Tiny Senoritas at the time, and they did a whole array, again, an umbrella of what I'd say is Pan-American dancing. So you had some Spanish, you had some Mexican dancing. Of course, everybody learned castanets. It was a mix of items. We can switch slides. And here are the tiny senoritas on your right. And um, there's another dancer there, Vivian Cuadra, a native of Albuquerque, um, who she actually didn't stay in New Mexico. She went off to Spain and 
just wanted to study and had a full professional flamenco career in Spain. But the big thing was for all of these young dancers learning and handing and learning these dances. Sometimes it was the big touring companies that were touring nationally and internationally. Carmen Amaya on the left, um, um, you know, they would sell out the Hollywood Bowl. They would perform in New York. Um, she was offered huge contracts to stay down in Buenos Aires, Mexico City. There was another big stop for a lot of these people and flamenco spread to many major cities around the world. Saul Hurak noticed um, Carmen Amaya in Buenos Aires and is responsible for bringing her to New York in the 40s. She starred in 17 um, American films as herself. She did not, her first film, she plays a character in, but all of her others, she is herself. And Jose Greco, of course, starred in many American films too, and a Timex watch commercial that I remember as a kid, he was stomping and flamenco dancing all over this watch. And of course the watch never broke. Um, but um, some of the um, people that came into New Mexico and Vicente was one of them. He had grown up dancing. Vicente's mother was, were actually distant cousins. My great grandmother, Maria Nicolasa Roybal, and his mother was a Roybal. Um, we're both musicians. My grandmother taught, my great grandmother taught and played piano. His mother did violin. And I heard a lot of family stories from my great aunt Monica when I was working on the exhibit. I never knew this growing up as a kid. And I found out we were cousins, but a lot of the families would have a musician in the family. So Vicente grew up with this mother who played violin and did Spanish music, but he always wanted to perform. He was in speech and debate, but he was sent off to Spain, joined Pilar Lopez. We can change the slide. And he comes back from Spain. And again, there's this connection um, with the language. Vicente was really proud of his Hispano heritage. And this time in New Mexico, um, you know, people sometimes identified as Spanish or as Mexican. But what was really important to a lot of them, and Vicente included, whether you were doing mariachi or flamenco or whatever type of music you were doing, the promotion of Hispano heritage and the promotion of language. And so through, he used flamenco and traveled all over the state to um, teach Spanish. And this was a time period in the 60s. We're now in the 60s. He went to Spain in the 50s. But um, people weren't teaching their children Spanish at home anymore. So the gen my father's generation and my aunts and uncles no longer learned Spanish in the home. However, grandparents' generation, they all spoke fluently in Spanish and you heard it in the household, but they weren't teaching it to you. They could tell all their family secrets in Spanish and the little kids would not understand. But Vicente was very big on, no, we need to take back the language and promote our heritage and he did it through dance, but he also started the big flamenco scene, which um, spurred on many careers of women who have then just taken it to new depths, which we're gonna come all the way to the modern times, but um, El Nido, the Patio Flamenco, it was a traditional flamenco tablao and he brought in gitanos, actual flamencos from Spain and um, set up these nightly shows around the Santa Fe Opera. So people would leave the opera, go over to El Nido and see the flamenco show. But students and um, people flocked. Um, Tasuke became kind of known as another Spain. You could meet real gitanos playing guitar there. And one such guitarist came all the way from Boston as a young student and never left, um, El Nino David. We can switch slides. But one of our most famous, of course, is Maria Benitez, who grew up in Taos Pueblo. And um, as a young girl, she loved dance. She was very passionate about dance and, and her words wanted to be a ballerina. And then very soon discovered, as she said, I didn't have the figure or the temperament for ballet. And a friend, a girlfriend of hers was actually um, going to Denver to study some flamenco up there. And Maria would travel up there from Taos from time to time and started learning the Spanish dance and flamenco and very soon realized she needed to go to the homeland of flamenco dance and go to Spain and study there. And she did um, intensive work in Spain. And when she came back over, um, Vicente had a knack for picking the right leading ladies because he had also partnered with a woman named Lidia Torea who traveled, who toured with Jose Greco and then Maria Benitez and many people um, to this day remember seeing these two and just really talking about 
the the emotion and the passion and the intensity of their dance, the footwork and the talent. Um, they were together for several years, but Maria, you know, very quickly wanted to have her own company, her own business. Um, he moved out of El Nido and went to um, what is now El Gancho. He opened a place called the Sambra after the, and kind of modeled it after the caves of the Sacro Monte in Granada. And Maria took over El Nido and kept that for many seasons. And then she moved into the La Fonda Hotel. And this was a time, and we're, we're back that way again in New Mexico, thanks to many contemporary women dancers. But there were, at any given time, several nightly shows, at least six nights a week. And, and all these people, when you interview them, they talk about how they're one night off. They'd go see, to see the other person's show because a lot of these shows would have a huerga or a jam session after where the musicians and dancers would come together very much like jazz um, where you in, do improvisation and just jam all night long. So Maria talked a lot about um, those types of evenings and we can do the next slide. Here's some more um, fabulous pictures of Maria. Of course, she went on to create um, her own um, nightly show at the what is now named after her, the Benitez Cabaret at the Lodge of Santa Fe. And she was there for almost 20 years, I believe. Um, as, a, as a teen, I got to work in her box office and remember the night when Mikhail Baryshnikov actually came to watch her dance. That was a huge deal. Um, she was that famous that Baryshnikov came to see her. Um, she danced at the Joyce every year. She would bring in top dancers from Spain, many of whom have made Santa Fe their home and are still working and teaching and living here today. But I wanted to include an early Anido photo because following in the footsteps of Carmen Amaya that we saw earlier, Maria was famous for doing her Alegrias number in pants. And for anybody that flamen thinks flamenco just expresses um, torment and anger and sadness, the Alegrias comes from the word happiness and it does express um, extreme happiness in that dance. Um, it comes from the town of Cadiz on the southwestern coast of Spain, from which all the ships from Spain came over to the New World initially. Next photo. But Maria um, also um, worked a lot with and influenced other people working in, um, in flamenco and Spanish dance. This again is Lily del Castillo, who I showed on Old Town Plaza. And she credits Vicente as really um, taking her in under his wing. Um, she looked very Gitana. She looked like straight from Spain. And he told her, you're doing Spanish dance, but I'd love to show you flamenco. Now, the family going back in New Mexico too, when I showed Clarita Garcia de Aranda, um, Lily is actually a distant cousin of the Garcias. Um, and so Lily and Evan Senia Sandoval are actually distant, distant cousins and both ended up in flamenco separately. They didn't grow up you know, together as first cousins, but um, she um, went over and studied in Spain. This is her husband, Luis Campos, who also has been performing since the 60s here. But um, Lily del Castillo had her own company, Rincón Flamenco, and did um, really innovative shows. She would do um, tablao type shows. She danced at El Nido for years, but she um, would do these um, full um, scale flamenco dance dramas and take stories out of New Mexico history. And one of them was called Petanera, which is a song form in Spain, but is very similar to the telling of La Llorona here in New Mexico. And they did a flamenco dance drama of that. But her most um, well-known work is called Revelaciones. And she did a whole telling of the Sephardic Jews um, leaving during the Inquisition and coming to New Mexico. And she did it as a flamenco dance drama. And um, I was fortunate enough to be in the very first um, performances of that as an inquisitor. I got to torment Lily in her nightmare um, that she had. But that actually toured um, around the country. It has appeared on public television in Canada, still not in, on the US public television, but um, she um, did it all over the state as well and just really contributed to um, not a, a lot of flamencos love history and the women especially they like telling the story of the women um, coming over so she is a young girl in spain and discovers her family heritage and flees for the new world next slide um, i'm trying to keep this all under 15 minutes so i'm talking really fast 
Um, but we will move um, to Evan Sinia Sandoval, who, again, the daughter of Clarita Garcia de Aranda, who is, aside from Maria Benitez, is our most well-known uh, woman dancer in New Mexico. Um, Eva is about 10 years younger, so she um, really burst onto the scene about 10 years later. Um, the early Anido days were taking place in the 60s, and um, Eva's a young girl at the time, and her mother is still holding um, house parties and huergas in these communities. Um, come together. They're very small communities. Um, New Flamenco in New Mexico is huge today. It was a lot smaller, um, less people doing it back then because you did not have a full-fledged university degree program, which Eva started. She was a dance major at UNM and for her thesis wanted to work on flamenco. And from there, it just um, moved into a full-fledged dance program. You can get a BA um, MA, MFA in dance with a concentration on flamenco. And it's the only program in the entire nation where you can do that. Um, you can learn um, the Boston Conservatory of Music. You can study flamenco, but I don't think there's a full degree program there. But this is an early image of Eva when she was performing. So again, she was a dancer, but um, a lot of these women went on and did so much more. And I think the big thing about this is people very often see flamenco as a performance art and the pretty ruffles or the flower. And they, they think, oh, um, you know, what a pretty dancer. But in addition to the hours and hours and hours of not only rehearsing, you're an athlete, you have to stay in shape. You're an artist, you know, dance and music falls under the arts. You're an athlete and artist. Usually you're your own business administrator because there's not a lot of promotion of flamenco. You create your own company. Um, many of them are nonprofits today and educational institutions, but you are also an educator. Um, dance is handed down either in the family with flamenco or from master to student. Um, originally, um, flamencos, you didn't read music. You know, you learned by watching. Um, your teacher would play something on the guitar and you had to play it or the singer sings it you sing it back to them. Um, it's changed a little bit now. There is annotation and different things. But Eva, this is a poster of her first company, Ritmo Flamenco, in 86. And this was the year that she um, dreamt up and decided to have the very first flamenco festival, which the first meeting um, was in the living room of Lily Del Castillo and Luis Campos, who I showed previously. But Lily and Lou were working regularly with the Santa Fe community and Eva brought up this idea of I want to create a festival. So the Flamenco Festival just this past year, it is the longest running in the world, 35 years going. Um, during the pandemic, the whole entire thing was held on Zoom. Um, it's um, workshops, eight days of nonstop, eight hours a day in dance, in um, guitar, in singing. Um, there's history classes on flamenco history. Um, there's nightly um, shows and presentations. They do a biennial flamenco history conference. And this year, um, the Humanities Council actually um, sponsored, they did um, just a flamenco in New Mexico lecture series this year, which I thought was very interesting because um, one of the, the well-known singers in New Mexico is Hanisero. When we talk about the mestizaje that Robin brought up, he um, his family is related to uh, Francisco Gonzalez El Comanche from Rancho de Taos. And again, you know, when we talk about that, the rating and the exchange and the you know exchange of women that took place, um, there's a lot of mixed blood people that have Spanish and Comanche heritage, but Vicente is putting some of the New Mexican traditional um, music that are called inditas that tell these stories and he's doing them to flamenco rhythms. And that was one of the presentations at the conference. Um, next slide. This is a later picture of Evan Sinias dancing at one of the festivales. This is from, I believe this was 1992. And she, she danced regularly, but she actually um, stopped performing to dedicate herself full time to running the festival and running um, um, the National Institute of Flamenco that they started and the Conservatory of Flamenco Arts which is um, running strong today in Albuquerque. And there's also a charter school called Tierra Adentro. And um, 
the Conservatory of Flamenco Arts starts children as young as age three, and they have a program they call Cradle to Career. And many of the students that start in this program, um, the Tierra Dentro Charter School, you can concentrate in dance or in music. And they also have New Mexican traditional arts, um, you know, full school curriculum, but um, you're at a conservatory, so you can go from grades six through 12 doing a dance program. And many of those dancers go on to other universities around the country. Um, several um, have their PhD in dance or music. Um, many um, come back to New Mexico and teach at the conservatory, um, perform um, in the festival, perform with the American Flamenco Repertory Company, Ihastros, which comes out of the conservatory as well. Um, Eva retired two years ago, we can switch slides, um, and is still teaching the youth and still performs at the tabla, but it is her daughter, Marisol Insinias, who is now the director of the Conservatory of Flamenco Arts and the National Institute of Flamenco. And Marisol, again, a dancer, but dedicates most of her time now. She teaches still, um, has students, but um, I should mention Eva just this year was um, awarded the National Heritage Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts in Folk and Traditional Arts. She's also a recipient of the Bravo Awards twice in Albuquerque. She's gotten the Bravo Award along with the National Institute of Flamenco for their education. But this year she got the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Bravos in Albuquerque. So major deal. Um, but Marty Soul is continuing um, the National Institute of Flamenco on into the future and the festivalis um, and organizing the lectures and workshops and everything to do with that. And this is her in her early years dancing at the festival. <laughs> Next slide. Um, we need to end. Go real quick. Okay. Yeah. These are some of the people that came out of either um, coming to New Mexico because of flamenco here or out of the UNM program. Um, Mina Fajardo, all the way from J Japan, now living in Santa Fe. And Estefania Ramirez is another one who's created um, school curricula that is used um, all over the nation. Um, during the pandemic, she reached 10,000 students in Texas with their school curricula, 17 schools in Santa Fe, um, programs in Idaho, New York, all over. Um, she and her husband run their own company here called Antre Flamenco and own El Flamenco de Santa Fe on Palace Avenue. Next slide. Um, I can, if you have questions later, I can answer some of them. Yeah, because we're running out. Um, but this is just um, some of the women that have their own companies today and are developing wonderful programs and um, taking this further than it's ever gone before. Julia Chacon now resides in Phoenix. Um, Carmen Montes is from Mexico, but makes her home in Albuquerque along with Juani de la Isla. And they do a free family program every Sunday for kids and parents. Uh, Lucy Lenne um, taught at a charter school in Las Cruces for 13 years. And along with her husband, Paco Antonio, he taught at, um, at New Mexico State University for 17 years, but they created curricula as well and took kids to Spain um, six summers in a row for a month long intensive. Um, last slide, but the community celebrations continue. So academically, you can learn a lot, um, but there's still, this is an early picture of La Emmy, who is also performing here in Santa Fe and has her own company as a young dancer in Maria's Next Generation. But this was one of the community gatherings. There's so many dancers out there that just still come together in the old ways um, of the fandangos of days past. Great. Um, I'm sorry we have to catch you up, but uh, we uh, have one more speaker and we're running out of time. Um, Sylvia Ramos Cruz is a retired general surgeon, poet, writer, and women's rights activist. Her photographs and award-winning poetry and prose have appeared in Artemis Journal, Chamisa Journal, Choice Words, Writers on Abortion, Journal of Latina Critical Feminism, Malpais Review, Persimmon Tree, Southwest American um, Literature Journal, La Cronica de Nuevo Mexico, online biographical dictionary of women's suffrage in the US in her own right, 
a century of women's activism from 1820 to 1920. Sylvia has given many, many talks uh, about the suffragists in the Mexico uh, suffrage movement, which is very, very important. And um, I know that she can give a whole, you know, hour long talk and her YouTubes are available. So, uh, but we, um, we asked her to try to summarize into just a few minutes. And so go, take it away, please. Thank you all for staying here. Um, I, uh, I have my talk and it should be right under 15 minutes, which was the allotted time. I understand if some of you have to leave, um, but I'll appreciate it if you stay. The March for, for Women's Suffrage in New Mexico dates from 1874, when it was first introduced into the New Mexico legislature, to 1921, when the Constitution was amended to allow women to vote in all New Mexico elections, not just for school boards. Hundreds of women contributed to that victory. I have the names and some of the stories for over 100 of those women. The many others who marched, sewed banners, took turns caring for children while their suffrage sisters rallied, mimeographed flyers, lobbied legislators, and stood up to ridicule for wanting the vote remain unknown. Much of the work uh, uh, for the vote was done by women in women's clubs. Most of them were well-to-do Euro-American urban women. A few were Hispanas. While their work ultimately benefited all community members then and continues to have an impact today, club women excluded many from their ranks. Working through the fact of segregated organizations, they missed out on the opportunity to engage with women of color, such as activist, educator, musician, and choir director Lula Black, who also labored to uplift her life and community. Most suffragists were college educated and many were employed. They kept up with world events, scientific discoveries, and new ideas. And they banded together for decades, despite religious, political, economic, and social differences to make real the dream they shared. By 1914, suffragists had become well known for their civic activities and community improvements. This snippet of film shows a bit of suffrage history in Albuquerque. We see men and women marching and cheering. The Women's Christians Temperance Union members write cards and the suffragists write in the votes for women, right there, votes for women cars. Despite this shared celebration, there was still a long way to go before women were accepted as voters. When Alice Paul's more militant suffrage group, the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage came to New Mexico in 1914, the hum for the vote became a roar. Here is a sprinkling of the women who roared. They range in age from 20 to 63. Some had just joined the campaign. Others had been fighting for decades. Adam McPherson Morley was uh, in her own words, always and ever on the alert to gain my own liberty. For over 25 years, she activated for the ballot yet died without ever holding it in her hand. She was a a rancher, businesswoman, writer, activist, reformer, and a young widow raising three children on a ranch in the town of Daddill. Despite that, she frequently rode her cart over 100 miles each way to participate in suffrage meetings and activities in Albuquerque. In 1890, she proposed and led a suffrage department for the Christian Temperance Union, which held what may be the first debate on suffrage in New Mexico in 1910. Over the years, she wrote articles and hundreds of letters to congressional representatives, legislators, newspapers, and friends urging their support of women's vote. On her death in 1917, the Evening Herald wrote, Great woman gone. No more brainy idealist ever lived than this Tolstoy of the Dattils.
Teacher and civic leader Cora Kellum dedicated her life to activism for women's rights. After the 19th Amendment was ratified, she joined Alice Paul in the fight for equal rights. Her suffrage activities began in 1896 through the Territorial Association for Women's Suffrage. As many suffragists had done for years, she traveled by railroad several, several times to Washington, D.C. to lobby congressmen before 1920 for the vote and after 1920 for the Equal Rights Amendment. In 1918, as New Mexico's representative of the National Women's Party, she met with, the pres with President and Mrs. Wilson at the White House to ask the president to rush the amendment through the Congress. She had an impassioned message for the, uh, for the president. And at the end, she ended asking, won't you help us? The president said, yes, I will. And he did. Despite ongoing grief at the loss of her only child and chronic disabling physical pain, she persisted as a vocal advocate of equal rights for women until her death. Maud McPhee Bloom grew up in a home where both parents were suffragists and members of the Territorial Association for Equal Suffrage. She also wore many hats, singer, pianist, historian, folklorist, translator, writer, playwright. As Albuquerque Women's Club historian, she wrote the 50th anniversary booklet, which is a chronicle of 50 years of women's activism for community improvement and women's rights. Thank you. She was a member of Carrie Chapman Katz National American Woman Suffrage Association, the moderate group working nationally for the vote. As part of the suffrage league that brought together moderate and militant factions, she met at the governor's mansion many times in 1918 and other years to discuss various aspects of suffrage and how to present the vote to legislators before the legislative sessions to gain their support. She is among several New Mexico women recognized for the work in the sixth volume of the history of women's suffrage that came out in 1922. Nina Otero Warren was born into two well-to-do, well-connected, politically influential families in New Mexico. They sparked her interest in politics and community services. Her work for suffrage began in 1910 at the territorial convention where women women got only the vote for the school boards. In 1914, she joined the Congressional Union and was one of six Hispanic members. She was fully bilingual and worked to register members uh, to the association and also worked to educate the public about how women casting their own votes would benefit families and communities. For years, she worked uh, with the congressional delegation in Washington, D.C., traveling there several times, and with the New Mexico legislators to rally and steady their support for women's suffrage. In the special session of the New Mexico legislature in 1920, her political savvy helped overcome forces of resistance from patriarchal clergy and politicians who were not ready to accept women as equals in the voting booth or anywhere else. Among her many titles were educator, politician, businesswoman, homesteader, writer, civic leader, and advocate for the preservation of Spanish language and culture in New Mexico. Pardon me. Isabella Selmes Ferguson grew up in New York among socialites and the families of both Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt. Who could predict that she would become a homesteader, businesswoman, philanthropist, civic leader, politician, and legislator? In 1910, she moved with her husband who had tuberculosis and their family to Silver City. They initially lived in the tents in the sanatorium compound and later homesteaded and homeschooled the children in the Buru Mountains. After her husband's death in 1922, she moved to Arizona and in 1934 become, became Arizona's first woman and only congressional representative in Washington, D.C. In 
In 1922, she canvassed for, for Teddy Roosevelt's Bull Moose Party, whose platform advocated for women's suffrage. She was a member of Silver City's Women's Club and served on the Grand County Board of Education. In 1918, she was asked to her, sorry, in 1918, she was asked to head the Women's Land Army in New Mexico to bring in the crops planted by men who had, let, who had left for war. 500 farmers joined her. They worked under harsh conditions. Isabella even helped nurse some of her workers during the 1918 influenza pandemic. Nevertheless, the women smiled and got the job done. Aurora Lucero was an orator, educator, champion for Spanish language education, translator, folklorist, and writer. At age 17, she gave an impassioned speech that was celebrated throughout the Southwest, urging the continued teaching of Spanish in public schools. Like Nina Otero Warren, she came from old New Mexico, an old New Mexico family, and was very political, well-connected. The women joined hands to reach Spanish-speaking people through the Spanish language uh, promotional flyers and rallies. Her speech, her speech at a large rally, El Porvenir de los Niños, the future of children, stressed the health and well-being of children as reasons for women to get the vote. Many were convinced and joined the movement then. In 1915, as part of a deputation of 150 suffragists, she was the lead speaker asking Senator Thomas Catron to support women's suffrage. But no one could say this, could sway the, the senator. He said women were the weaker sex who, were, who bore the children and would be soiled by the dirty game of politics. Yes. He was a senator who was on the Committee for Women's Suffrage in the Senate in DC, and he was against suffrage. The women though had the last laugh when the very next year, the senator was defeated in his primary run for another term and a pro-suffrage senator was elected. Even without the vote, women were able to effect change prior to 1920. Their activism led to raising the age of protection for girls from 10 to 14, creation of juvenile courts, protection of women's community property rights in marriage, and passage of the Prohibition Amendment, among others. Soledad, uh, sorry, as uh, 1920 approached and suffrage became a train rushing down the tracks, both political parties scrambled to get on and bring women to their side. This gave women political power, which they used to ask women candidate, ask for women candidates and introduced their legislative agenda. In 1922, they came out in large numbers to exercise the right they had worked 46 years to gain. Several women were elected to political office statewide. Among them, Soledad Chavez Chacon, New Mexico's first woman secretary of state. Amid jubilation and the end of the campaign, there was also the recognition, especially among the leaders, that it would take more to ensure equal rights than the vote. And there, were, there was also the belief, however, that the vote had equipped women to get the job done for their equal rights. Sadly, despite 100 years of voting, every day we see women's rights to participate fully in every sphere of human endeavor abridged or denied. And we see laws, judicial decisions, and executive actions aimed at protecting women's rights, ignored, whittled, repealed, overturned. No number of such laws, judicial decisions, or executive actions will ever guarantee women's right to equal justice under law. Only an amendment can. That is why Alice Paul, in 1923, wrote the Equal Rights Amendment and worked for it until her death in 1973. 99 years later, we are still working to see it become the law of the land. In contrast, a bill to add equal rights protections to the New Mexico Constitution was sponsored by Rep. 
Representative Max Cole in 1972. He wanted to ensure that if the federal amendment failed, New, Mexican, New Mexicans would have their equal rights guaranteed. Many in New Mexico um, lobbied fiercely and went to great lengths for the ERA. Among these activists was Frances Williams, who was even willing to follow a male politician running from her into a bathroom to make her case. And she really boasts about that on, a, uh, on a, an interview I saw not too long ago. New Mexicans approved the amendment uh, for New Mexico State, and then the next year, they approved the national ERA. Today, the New Mexico ERA has been used successfully in the courts to ensure abortion health care cover, coverage by Medicaid and marriage equality for all. Additionally, the guarantee of equal rights helped change property rights, access to equal education, and parental custody rights in New Mexico. My hope is that greater awareness of the amendment's potential utility will bring it to mind when cases of gender-based discrimination are considered, including one looming ahead, abortion health care access. In a democracy, the vote is the most important tool we have to build a society and country we envision. Suffragists knew that having men speak for them in the halls of political power was not enough to effect the change they saw needed in their communities. To do that, women had to have the vote themselves. And they also knew, as we have learned for after 100 years of voting, that having the vote is not enough to build an equal society. To do that, we need the voices of those who have women's interests at heart, women. In, pro in proportion equal to the representation in the population at all levels of government. Going forward, votes for women should be our mantra, vote for women, until we are equally represented in our government. We are 51.6% of the country. We can do that and finally get equal rights under the law and be able to stand as equal citizens under the sky with men. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sylvia ended with a point that I think we all need to uh, keep in mind. We need more women's representation in legislatures and Congress on school boards, boards in general, commissions and so on. And we've got to encourage young um, students to understand not just girls, but boys and girls about the important contributions that um, half of the population make to making our democracy work. Uh, the League of Women Voters believes in the power of women to make a more perfect union and uh, empower democracy. And we will uh, be asking you to encourage everybody to vote. Uh, October 8th, our voter guides for the uh, uh, the general election will be available online, vote411.org, and vote411.org across the country. You will be able to get voter guides. So we really need everybody to turn out. We want to have you go and dig up your own family stories, dig up the stories, make sure they're told. And most important, uh, uh, make sure people get to the um, get to cast their ballots. And those who can't, young students or um, non-citizens, there is always a place where they can engage. We really need to have our democracy represent all of us. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Santa Fe Prep. Thank you, Humanities Council. Um, this has really been an enriching experience.